Hello and welcome to the God's Words Bible Study and as usual we will start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you Lord for all that you have done for us and we pray Lord that you will forgive us of our sins, that you will cleanse our hearts and our mind and that you will teach us Lord all that we need to know. We pray Lord that you will fill us with the Holy Ghost so that we can practice what you taught us. These things we pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And we're on the book of Romans, where we're doing an expositional Bible study, meaning that we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And the last time we met, we stopped at Romans chapter 9, verse 24. And so today we will pick it up from Romans chapter 9, verse 25 to the end of the chapter. As he said also in Osei, I will call them my people which are not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained unto righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen, amen. Okay, so verse 25 say, as he said also in Isaiah, I will call them my people, which were not my people. And just to give us a little context, if you remember, last time we studied, we saw in 21, where Paul asks, has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And then he says in verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Verse 23, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And then he goes on and he says, as he said also in Isaiah. So here's what's happening here. If you remember when we started the chapter, Paul talks about how he had this great heaviness and sorrow in his heart for his people, Israel. And then he said something very strange, which is, he said in verse 6, Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And from there he launched into the tracing of the seed, the promise of God to Abraham, until he came down to Pharaoh and he explained to us how God's sovereignty worked in Pharaoh's life as God delivered them through Pharaoh. And what he was actually teaching us is that God's sovereign will cannot be tampered with. And whatever it is that God is working out, it's a lot of times to us strange and sometimes painful, but that God knows what he is doing. And so in the context of this, what Paul is saying is that even though he had this great heaviness and sorrow in his heart for Israel, he knows that God is working out everything. And so he comes down here now to verse 25, and this is what he say. He say here in the New Testament, it's Ose, but in the Old Testament, it's Hosea. And here is what he says. I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. And because he just mentioned in verse 24, but also of the Gentiles, a lot of people think that here he's talking about the Gentiles. And because God has always favored the descendants of Abraham, particularly those from whom the seed would come, that when it talks about, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which were not beloved, that he is talking here about the Gentiles, about those who were not of the tribe of Israel. But no, 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 no. 
he is still talking about Israel. He's still talking about the Jews and the Israelites, but more particularly the Israelites right here. And the way we figure this out is that we... So you, you mean the two kingdoms saying the Jews and the Israelites? Right. Remember, the nation of Israel split into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And at this point, when Paul is writing them, the kingdom of Israel is still dispersed. They're still in exile, so to speak. And unrecognizable. No, no. They are recognizable because if we go back and we look at certain of the letters in the New Testament, I think the letter of First Peter, it starts, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Appadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these strangers scattered... That's Israel. That's the kingdom of Israel. And as you just mentioned, also the book of James, which is kind of funny, um, the book of James is, is not written to the Gentiles. It's actually written to the Israelites. And so when we go to the book of James, the first verse in the first chapter, the introduction, it reads, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad, greeting and if we have an eye for this, we will see this occurring a lot in the New Testament that the church is writing to the 12 tribes, to all the tribes of Israel that are scattered. At this time, they knew where they were. But here it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 25, it says, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. And as I said, a lot of people interpret this as to be the Gentiles, but it's not. And the way we figure this out is that if we go to the source where Paul is quoting, then we will see this. So let's go to the first book of Hosea. And we are going to read verse 9 to 11. But before we do, let me just give you some context here. God told Hosea to go down to the red light district and marry the first prostitute he sees. Because what God is doing is that God is using Hosea's life to be a living testimony against the Israelites to show them that just as unfaithful as Uzziah's wife will turn out to be is the same way in which Israel and Judah are unfaithful to God. But he's doing another thing with Uzziah is that as Uzziah and this woman have children, he is naming the children and he is using the children's name to prophesy against both Israel and Judah. Because at this time, both kingdoms are still in existence. And in verse 4 he says, And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of Israel. So that, that's not a very nice prophecy. And then there's one more, one more prophecy I want to show you before we read the verses that we are interested in today. Verse 6 and 7. And it says, And she conceived again, and bear a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Loruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. I will what? I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. So God is saying that he's going to do away with the kingdom of Israel. Verse 7, But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. And will not save them by bow or by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Verse 8. And now when he had weaned Lorohama, she conceived and bare a son. And let's read that now, verse 9 to 11. Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. So there it is. Who, who is God talking to? Hosea. He's talking to Hosea, but he's talking through Hosea. To Israel. To Israel. To the kingdom of Israel. You see that? Because remember, just before that he said that he will not have mercy upon the kingdom of Israel, but he will have mercy upon Judah. And now he's continuing and he says, in verse 9, For ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Go on. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Amen. Verse 11. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together, and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Okay. So what God is saying here is that 
he is going to cut Israel off, but he's not going to cut Israel out. You see that? Because he says that, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. Now hold on. If they are so much, how come we don't know where they are? Because God hasn't done as yet what he promised to do in this very verse. And it says, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. There shall it be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Now where did God tell them that they are not his people? The Israel. Exactly. So he told them in the land of Israel that they were not his children. And so he's saying that that is exactly where he's going to tell them that they are his children. That is where God is going to take the two firebrands and the two sticks and he's going to put them together. And the nation of Israel shall once again be one nation. Right now when we look at Israel, that's not Israel. That's not the nation of Israel. That is just Judah. Right. With a little Benjamin and a little Levi sprinkled in. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is to have all 12 tribes come back together. Right now, we don't know them. And worse, guess what? They don't know themselves. Because do you know that right now they're living under a curse? Because God said to them, Because you love to serve other gods, I am going to let you go and you're going to serve these other gods and you're going to forget who you are. And so guess what? They are forgotten. But God has a way that he will remind them and he will tell them who is who and he will reunite them in the land of Israel. And so when we go back now to Romans chapter 9, verse 26 says, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. So you see, clearly it is not talking about the Gentiles. Because Uzziah never mentioned anything going to the Gentiles. He was talking about God spanking these two little rotten kids. Right. Right? Okay, verse 27. Isaiah, that's Isaiah, also cried concerning Israel, that though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Hold on. What short work? He has been working on this for more than 2,000 years. It's short to God, because God says what? One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. He said, no, no, no. He's going to make a short work of it, but he's not ready yet. Right, Why isn't it could he... also mean that when he executes judgment, it's going to be just quick. Right. But remember, he's not ready yet, because if we go back in the context of what we are reading right now, we go back up to verse 22, it says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he has afore prepared unto glory? So if we put it in that context, this lull that we have had, and, and I'll show you as we go along, this lull that we have had in the history of Israel is so that the Gentiles may be saved. And Paul does come back to them in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. And so we'll see that in chapter 11 when we reach there. But this part where he says, now he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, that is taken from Isaiah 10, 20 to 23. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord and the Holy One of Israel in truth. So when it says stay upon them is that they're dependent on the people who are persecuting them. Right. And God said he's going to cut that nonsense out and they're going to now depend on God himself. Go on. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decree shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. Okay, so this is where Paul is getting about. And when he talks about he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, that's the consumption. That, as you say, is that when God is ready to act, it's going to be fast. He's going to just be moving through quick, quick. Okay, let's jump back to Romans chapter 9, verse 29, and it reads, And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath, and by the way, the Lord of Sabbath, it sounds like the Lord of Sabbath. It's not the law of Sabbath. 
Sabbath here is it means host. Is a Lord of hosts or in army. the New Testament, or the as you just said, captain of the Lord's army. That's a position that it's referring to, not the Lord of Sabbath, as some people misread it. When Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, this is not what he's talking about. This is the Lord of hosts. This is Jesus, but this is a different position than what he was talking about when he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath also. Okay? And he says, Except that the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had been made like unto Gomorrah. So what he's saying is that, listen, this is where God says, I will have mercy upon those who I will have mercy and I will have compassion on, on whom I will have compassion. Because truly, Israel had become worse, and the Bible has alluded to this and said this plainly several times, that they had become worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus yet, said it. Yeah. Yet, because of a promise made to a single man thousands of years before, God will not destroy them utterly. He will punish them. He will cast them out. He will exile them. He will bring them to nothing, but then he has to bring them back because the promise cannot be broken. Right. Jesus said that if Sodom and Gomorrah were around to see his days, they would, they would not have been destroyed. But here it is that these guys didn't even believe on him. Exactly, exactly. Okay, and so let's jump down to Isaiah 1, 9 to 15 and see where Isaiah spoke about Israel and Sodom and Gomorrah. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. So here is actually speaking to Israel, not Sodom and Gomorrah. Go on. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and sabbaths, the calling of assembles, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Amen, amen. And so that's where Paul is getting this from. Paul is getting it from where Isaiah is saying, Listen, everything that you're doing when you come to worship God, everything that you're doing in the temple of God is an insult and an affront to God. Because when you're not in the temple, what you're doing is unlike anything that God can condone. Because you are wicked and nasty outside and you come in here and you act all pious. And God says, who invited you here? I don't know you. You see? And this is just portraying to us the decline of Israel as Israel drifted away from God. And so let's jump back to Romans chapter 9 verse 30 which says, What shall we say then? The Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. And if you remember, earlier we went through this whole thing where Paul talks about that those who obey the word of God, those who obey the laws of God, their uncircumcision will be counted as circumcision. And those who do not obey the law of God, their circumcision will be counted as uncircumcision. So what God is saying here is that he is not looking at your practice and your rites and your rituals. What he's looking at is your lifestyle. And your heart. Exactly. So let's go back and just do a little quick refresher in Romans chapter 2. And I'll read for you verse 25 to 29. And it says, For circumcision verily profit if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who after the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? And catch this. 
For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And so you see, that is just wrapping right back up into Isaiah chapter 1. And so what God expected of his people and expect of us today who call ourselves Christian is that we should be just like him. Which is why Leviticus 20 verse 7 says, Sanctify yourself therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God. And if we jump back one chapter, we see Leviticus 19 verse 2 say, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. So God expects each and every one of us to be holy. holy. And we can't escape this. Because if we're going you know, to... I, I was listening yesterday to a discussion on YouTube. And there was somebody lambasting John Piper. Because John Piper said that faith alone can't save you. <laughs> which is basically what James says. And what he says is that if you have faith then that faith will produce in you a legacy of works. And it is those works that show your faith. And it's not just saying that you believe. It is actually believing and changing. Believing enough to do righteous work. Exactly. And the person was lambasting him saying that he is preaching another gospel. No, that is the gospel. The gospel is that I am wretched and wicked and cruel. But when the love of God come and I believe, then that belief change me into something that is gentle and loving and kind and holy yeah that is the new man that's being generated exactly and but they don't want to do this they don't want to teach this they don't want to teach the truth because what they want to teach is that you can go and you can live any old way you want because once you accept jesus christ then nothing that you do matters and so you have it now that the wicked are now calling the righteous wicked and calling the wicked righteous. And that's what the Bible said that would happen in the last days. Right. But this is not about prophecy. This is about the book of Romans. So let's go on to the next verse. And the next verse, verse 32, is question, how comes the Gentiles have gotten to righteousness whereby Israel, who should have been there all along, couldn't find it? And so it's a wherefore. Why? Because they sought it not by faith. But as it were, by the works of the law. You see? So and they wanted to do it themselves. They wanted, exactly. They wanted to get to God on their own terms. They wanted to be good people. So that God couldn't resist them. Because, ooh, I just gotta have this one. You get me? And so, it say, For they stumble at that stumbling stone. For as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And so, let, to, to understand what he's talking about with all of the stumbling stone. Now, we who are Christian know what the stumbling stone is, right? The stumbling stone is to believe that one man could die for everybody. Right. That the sacrifice of one individual could save and could cleanse the sins of everybody. How ridiculous that God should become a man, so to speak. No, 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 no. Let's go and read to see where Paul is getting this. It's Isaiah 8, 13 to 15. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a jinn and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Amen. Amen. So what it's saying here is that if you make God be your fear and if it may, you make God be your dread. Now, this is not talking about reverence. This is talking about fear and terror and being afraid. It's a if you make God be your fear, then guess what? You don't have to fear anything else. And if the only thing that you fear is God, then God will become your sanctuary. He will become your hiding place. He will become your protection. In case somebody else thinks Ex that this is just your interpretation. The New Living Translation says, Make the God of Heaven's army holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. 
Okay, See, that's good. definitely not respect that people tend to substitute fear for, but rather an awe and a dread, as the King James Version says. And they say, and he shall be for a sanctuary. So the very thing that is protecting you shall be for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Praise God, because this is how comes the gospel got out to the Gentiles. Because of this verse, this is how God worked it so that the Gentiles may be saved and so he may keep his promise to guess what? Abraham, where it told Abraham that through him all the nations of the world shall be blessed. You see how good God is? Because when you think that God's agenda, God's program is breaking down, we don't understand that that's just when it is building up. That's just the stepping stones that God lay. Because God has a plan that cannot be taught, that cannot be thwarted. Okay, let's jump down a few more verses to the end of the chapter, Isaiah 8, verse 22. It says, And they shall look upon the earth, and behold trouble, and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. So God is painting a very bleak picture here, but guess what, Joy? He is now going to introduce... The reason why in Romans chapter 9 verse 33, it says at the end of the verse, And whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. So now we're going to find out why we won't be ashamed. Because there will be bleakness and darkness. And guess what? In the very next chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, we see God's solution for this problem. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it, with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen, amen. So that is the rock of offense that God is putting in Jerusalem. Because if you remember, Isaiah 28 verse 16 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord of God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. He that believeth does not to worry. Why? Because in Matthew 21 verse 42 to 44, Jesus comes and he tells us exactly what this cornerstone is. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures, The stone which the builders reject the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Amen. Amen. And so, not only is Jesus referring to Isaiah talking about the stone, but he's also referring to David speaking about this same stone in Psalms 118, 22 and 23. The stone which the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. What happened is that when Jesus was quoting this verse, what he was saying is that when they rejected him, they were rejecting the cornerstone, but that even that rejection is a part of God's plan. And so God is going to use him to reveal the hearts of many, as he himself once said. Remember, there is this stumbling stone, and this stumbling stone is Jesus Christ. And as long as we hold fast, to the stumbling stone as long as we don't stumble over the stumbling stone as long as we remain true to the stumbling stone we will never be made ashamed because we will always be proven right in the end it became a stumbling stone because he didn't fit their preconception of what the messiah should be and should look like and do so we need to be careful that we don't allow what we perceive to be the right way or the right thing to, you know, to hinder us from doing what God wants us to do. 
There's also something else in these two last verses in Romans chapter 9, which when he says, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumble at that stumbling stone. And what that says to me is that to truly believe and to truly have faith in God, we have to understand that that involves work. But it is not the work that is getting us to where we need to be. Once we are saved, once God has come into our life, once faith is activated, this faith produces work. This faith is like gasoline to fire. It produces an explosion. It produces a reaction. And if you are a Christian and you are not driven first to be holy, to be righteous, to be just like the God you serve, then something is wrong. If you are satisfied with living with regrets and shame on a daily basis, if you are satisfied with stumbling and falling and being in the sewer and still call yourself a Christian, then my friend, just listen to me. That is the stumbling stone because the stumbling stone is now what you call faith. Because you think that all I have to do is have faith. All I have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No, that itself becomes a stumbling stone. Because now you're saying that as long as I once accepted Jesus Christ, then nothing that I do matters. Because God loves me too much to cast me into hell. And that now becomes your stumbling stone. And so we have to be very careful that there is a lot of little pitfalls that the devil has laid at our feet. So one of them, he will do what he did to the Jews. Hey, you just have to work hard. And as you work hard and keep the law and keep your rituals, then that's all you need. You don't have to, as Jesus put it, you don't have to practice the way to your matter of the law, which is love and helping other people. Right? Just need the appearance of it. You just need to do your little rituals and to pay your tithes and your offering and that type of external stuff. And so that's one pitfall. The other pitfall that he has is that he says, hey, you don't have to do any work. You don't have to pay the witches in the mind. All you got to do is have faith and do nothing. And so this is why Paul comes along and Paul tried to clear it up on one extreme where he says that what? Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. It is only of faith, right? So he's cleaning up on one extreme and then James come along and he's cleaning up on the other extreme where he's saying that what? Faith without works is dead. Right. Right. These two guys are not having arguments with themselves. What they're having arguments with is the fringes. Right. And if they should meet in the middle where they do, you will find that there is perfect harmony between these two guys and th- these two teachings. But when you bring anything to the extreme, when you start telling people that any type of improvement that they want to make to themselves spiritually, that that is works, then that's rubbish. And when you tell people that all they have to do is believe that they are saved even if they don't see any evidence of a changed life, then that's also rubbish. The Bible says that the devils believe and tremble. And so we know that believing is not all that there is. Right. You see, we have to believe, we have to accept, and we have to conform. Right. We have to conform to the image of Christ. Of Christ. And so if that is not happening in our lives, then we are stumbling at the stumbling stone. And as I said, we can be stumbling in opposite directions. We can be stumbling over faith, and we can be stumbling over work. But if you are truly a Christian, you will understand that neither of these things are stumbling stones. They are actually stepping stones. They are actually the way we express our love towards God in that we believe him and we act accordingly. That is faith and work. Uh, Yeah, I said this once before that we expect our children to obey us because they love us. And if we expect them to fall in line and do the things that we tell them to do out of love, why are we any different when it comes to our relationship with God? If he says for us to do these things, why is it any different? If we love him... He says we will keep his commandments. Right. And that is why what what Jesus meant when he says, whatever the Pharisees and the scribes tell you, that do. But don't do what they do because they say And and do not. And so, my friends, if you truly believe in Jesus Christ and if you want to be saved, then the first thing you need to do is repent of your sin, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and turn away 
from anything that made you need repentance in the first place. May God bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until we meet again, walk with the King and be a blessing. Goodbye.